Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 267 of Korea Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Simon Hinterman. He's an illustrator and designer from Switzerland. And of course, before going to the questions, let me quickly mention that in the four contacts section of the captions, we can find the ID to his Instagram account, the links to his link tree, Twitter, and also a link to in print store, which you can go there and, you know, see a lot of his illustrations as prints, you know, that you can buy and purchase, which is a great idea. They're all $10 and they're all, you know, if you like any of his works, and if you're watching this on YouTube, actually, and you see like a reel of his works above us right now, <laughs> and you know, if you like any of these and want to buy a gift for your loved one or someone or whatever, it's a good gift, you know, it's like they're nice prints to decorate around your house or your room. Whatever, you know, they're 10 bucks. They're great. They're amazing. You support the guests and artists of today's guests. What's not to love, right? <laughs> and with that out of the way, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. Uh, it's actually my free day today. So I have a day job for four days a week. And the mid of the week is just always free. Basically just for drawing, administrative stuff, prints, whatever. Yeah, just like the whole art thing in a way. So I'm doing well. Looking forward to the conversation. Oh, awesome, man. And all right, let's start off with the signature question of the podcast, which I always start off the episodes with, which is give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Like basically tell us, tell us your origin story of, you know, what led you to choose art as a path in your life. <laughs> so what actually led me to choose that, I don't really know. I can always tell you that um, I've been doing this as I was a little boy, basically. Um, I usually and always pretty much just wear with pencil, just only black and white. And I mean, we can speak a lot about or just think about why it was that I did it, but I seem to did it. And then, of course, you got just affirmation and wow, you're talented with it. And then you just stick through as a child that just motivates you. And then I've pretty much been the guy that always drew things until like 15 or whatever. So it's just always been, you could say, in my blood. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it uh, it came to be, but I've been drawing like all my life with pencil and then actually in school just got introduced to colors then pretty much like um, in the later stages of like puberty, whatever. And I just love color. And that's always something right now that I just, I can't let loose without color pretty much. So I tried working with black and white like I did as a boy, but then there's just always something lacking, which is that that vibrancy of the colors and that just that feeling of how it looks nice in a way. So yeah, that has been probably my my story with it. So pretty much from a boy. All right. So let me ask you quickly two questions that are on my mind. First of all, of what's the story behind your username? Our room? <laughs> Yeah, Arumek, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that is kind of cheesy in a way, uh, just something that's just sticked through. So when I started, that was, I think, in 2019 on social media. Um, I just always have liked gold in a way, just like the color. I am really in love with it. And Aurum is pretty much just the word, the Latin word for gold. And I just thought of basically that. And then it just sounded like, there needs to be something else. So it sounds like a bit like a name. And then I was just playing World of Warcraft my fr with my friend right then. And we just ended everything with Ek, basically. So there's just our mech. And that's something like really cheesy that just started off as like, I didn't think much of it, pretty much. And then you just stick with it, especially as your social media just grows and everything. You don't want to change around too much, or I at least I don't want to. So... I stuck with it, and I think it's it's fine, pretty much. Please send me your character in World of Warcraft was a mage or a wizard or something. Yeah, it was a mage. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> playing mage. Yeah, because our mage sounds like a mage name more than a yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, pretty much always playing mage if I have the ability to in video games. Yeah. Awesome. Do you still play WoW? I still play WoW uh, with one friend, um, but we um, stopped like a month ago with the new expansion. I just want to wait until everything is at max level and we can go again pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but like awesome. from time to time, like once every one or two years, we'll jump in for like one or two months and then it's that's basically it. Yeah, experience all the new patches and updates instead of just, you know, little by little. That's what I'm doing with Bubbles yeah. 3 right now. Oh, I, nice. I finished it once and mm -hmm. I'm waiting. So a lot of patches will be added. A lot of, have you played that game? 
No, no, I haven't. But I, I'm definitely, it's on my list. I have way too little time for all the video games that I want to play. Whatever your list is, you should put Baldur's Gate 3 at the top. Yeah, it's pretty much at the top. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Trust me. <laughs> and yeah, that's insane. And also another question I have in my dad, I said, I said two, two quick questions. Mm-hmm. Um, do you do you allow if anyone who's a 3D artist and wants to practice use your photos, like do 3D studies of your pieces? And of course, and of course, they will mention you. Is that okay? Do they have permission for any of 3D course, artists? Yeah. Definitely, just go for it. Um, whatever you do, just do it. I mean, people that are better than me and would kind of like overthrow me in a way won't copy my style anyways. So everybody below me is just learning, like I am as well. So just go for it. I mean, if it's credited, it's perfect. If it's not credited, I can't stop you. I probably won't even <laughs> won't even see it. Um, but it's always great to see people like copy their things in 3D. There haven't been too many people that have done that, um, but it's always been great if it has been done. It just looks cool. But yeah, no, the thing is, sure. as a 3D artist fan for myself, it's fun to take a photo from just one angle of a piece and try to make it in 3D as much as you can from just one single piece of image from me Definitely, of course yeah. and the thing is you know because i i don't want to go into a lot of details but one time let me tell you a story like late summer of 2022 i got i found an illustration on pinterest which i loved and i decided to do a 3d study of it make it and learn a lot of new things in blender and i worked on it for a week then it t- when it was time to post it i was like Wait, I need to find who made this illustration. And I went and went and went. I went back to the Pinterest board. I saved, I found it after a lot of digging. And I found the Twitter of the person who made that artwork. But I was surprised because um, literally on the Twitter bio, they wrote that um, no 3D practice, no AI, no NFT. And also a link to FAQ, which... It, described exactly that i don't want anyone to use my things as 3d practice you can use inspirations but i don't want my illustrations to be 3d modeled or me and i was and after that i kind of got trauma and i'm just asking anyone <laughs> asking permission from anyone's work that i like to study at some point but it's great that you ask but i think that's kind of weird because i can understand the sentiment that you don't want to have like ai feed on that thing but like it's 3d practice it's still like a work of art it's you're still copying no manually. you're copying that's what they said, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't personally I don't get this, but yeah, each to their own. And the weird thing is every time I ask anyone, they, they're all flattered actually. They said, Oh, you're yeah. going to me this in 3D? That's awesome. Cool. Let me know. And of course, like you know, it's it's wrong to make a 3D practice of someone's work and not mention them. Of course, it's obviously okay if you don't know them and you did your research and you didn't know them. But get what I mean? Yeah, of course. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a weird thing. Like, I, I wish a lot of things, I wish there was a rule book for the art community. Like, you know, all this, like, you know, like, bro code of Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother, remember that? But that for, you know, the etiquettes of, you know, the art community. I wish that was, that should be made. Dude, that, will, that will never exist. That is like saying you want a rule book for humanity. <laughs> that just doesn't work this way. There's well, way too many different opinions. So, yeah, billions I mean, of people actually think they have a rule book. The best yeah, actually, billions of people actually think they have a rule book for humanity, but that's another subject we I don't want to touch. But yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh God! All right, so let's go into the next topic, which is where you originally studying art and design, or were pursuing another career path. What I mean by that, like when you were much younger, of course, you explained briefly, like you know how when you were in you know teenage teenagers how things went. But you know, mm-hmm. I, want, I just want I want to know a little bit more in depth, like you know, were you when you were a teenager thinking that maybe I should have art as a hobby or maybe your parents said, or maybe because of the, I don't know how uh, Swiss society is like, Mm -hmm. but you know, like maybe because of the vibe and the environment there, you wouldn't think of art as a career or it was the opposite. You actually, everyone was okay. You knew exactly what to do, become an artist uh, as your main job and everything, or just how that thing pan out for you. How was the situation for you? So art, I'd say, Personally, art is like looked at as a career here in Switzerland. So it's not like you have to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, um, like it is in some other countries. Um, but it's definitely not like a safe choice. And Swiss people are like usually pretty risk averse. So they always kind of go for like the safe choice. You don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer or be like super high up, but it has to be safe in a way. Um, to be honest, when I was a teenager, I didn't think of an art career 
in any case, pretty much just I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> it was just always a hobby and something that I just liked to do um, and didn't really think about the future or building something up and whatever. Um, so, yeah, I pretty much just in high school, we had the option to, I say, choose a focus with our high school where we had just way more hours per week for that topic, for example, like science or music or art or whatever. And then I just chose art just because I liked it, but there hasn't been like a a, a deeper meaning or or a path behind me that I want to shape this into a career. That hasn't been the case. So yeah. Um, but in Switzerland, it's definitely, I mean, successful artists are like looked up way, down, way up to. So it's, it's definitely a high status thing, but of course not all of the people can do it. And the second thing with being an artist here in Switzerland, that is something that I can tell you from personal experience. Um, is that usually you're working internationally and since switzerland is so like really expensive you basically just come around with swiss wages and then you can live here in switzerland but if i sell something for like 300 dollars whatever that is like nothing here in switzerland so it's just that's like two times of buying groceries here and that doesn't really help you but you know what i mean because in offer in in, in different countries if you make like 600 dollars with your art in like a week you're set like you're pretty much set you can live off that and you just can't do that here in switzerland so no no chance in hell pretty much um so that is definitely an obstacle that is standing in the way of swiss artists because they you just have to upscale it to that much of a high level that you can actually live off the the high living costs here in switzerland so yeah but it's definitely a, a cool thing that is that is uh looked up to in a way. All right. And um, now here's an, another interesting question. What is your main branch of design that you're focusing on right now? And tell us about your experience from the start of it until now. Like what I mean by that, of course, in the introduction, I briefly mentioned that you're an illustrator and designer and all that stuff. But from when you started, like, you know, our journey, of course, all of us do at some point after a while, we realize, all right, we need to pick something and become a specialist in it. Or some people already know that from the beginning and they don't like anything else and they just know they have to go 100% on it. So how was the journey for you in terms of like, you know, finding your passion for illustration more than anything else? And what inspired you really? So I have read like, every fantasy book that there was in the city library when i was like a boy up until like 15 16 or whatever so fantasy books have just been a huge inspiration for me and then naturally i wanted to draw characters castles landscapes pretty much anything you can imagine that that has been imagined in those books and then after my pause with art i pretty much came back with characters combined with environments because just characters seems to me it seems not too interesting in a way because i just like to see environments and i'm not really talking just about like i like to see a river but maybe you have seen that in my pictures as well or in my drawings as well i like to see places that are being lived in so you can see that there's there are things that are broken there are things that are half built there are i don't know tools lying around whatever just like environments that tell a story and that has just been a transitional shift in a way without too much of a of a, a concrete thought about it so I, I didn't plan out to become or to to go into environments it just naturally happened because that was just my my uh interest in a way and then of course you get better with the things that you do and that, that interests you so now i'm pretty bad with characters and pretty I think I'm okay with landscapes or with environments. So <laughs> that usually just reinforces where you go even more because you're good with it and you're bad with the other. So yeah, that just naturally happened in a way. I don't know which one of your posts was it, but I think, did I see it on Twitter? By the way, your art station is up or not? I think my art station is deleted right now uh, yeah. because they started going into AI and basically feeding oh. everything to the models. Yeah. And then it's just like, there was no upside to our station for me i mean twitter oh, yeah. or instagram whatever can do that as well but there's huge upside with those mm -hmm. there wasn't really a, a upside with art station so yeah. i just got off with it yeah yeah it makes sense but i was gonna say like there was one of your artworks that um i don't know there was a caption of one of them that said like try to imagine as much as you can imagine like there was like i think there was this island tower thing island home one i don't know mm -hmm. 
the caption of it on Instagram that I'm seeing is something else, but I think it was another post of you that you wrote, like, imagine, like, you know, you're baking the bread. Like, I'm, when I'm trying to draw this piece, I'm imagining mm-hmm. the fresh smell of the baked bread, the breeze of the sea. I don't know, but that's kind of like, you know, mindset, like, you know, kind of thinking when it was written. I, I still, I'm sorry, I don't remember which post was it. <laughs> don't worry. That's so true. It's just be immersed in what you're trying to make. Definitely. It also just helps like building something that is believable and authentic. So if I draw, I mean, I really seldomly draw interiors, sometimes for commissions, but not too much. Um, so when I draw like a house from the outside, I usually think about how that house looks from the inside, because that will shape like where the chimney is, where like stairs are in that house. So where stairs are in that house, there can't be a window there. You know what I mean? So it makes it more authentic while a beginner just wants to draw a pretty house and then maybe draws like a window somewhere and then like a chimney above it which just doesn't work that way (laughs) so that is just a huge advantage of being immersed in your art or in in your worlds basically because it's just more detail and more believable in a way yeah and especially like aside from your listen i would gladly buy an art book if you have like you know uh, especially the style I personally like. Uh, I'm talking about the Stargazer Sanctuary right now, that piece when it's oh, just yep. line art. Mm-hmm. Like, if there's an art book filled with like a world building and stuff, like in that style, in that art mm-hmm. style, I'll buy it. Like, because it reminds <laughs> me of the art books and just, you know, a story books I used to read as a as a kid, like the short mm-hmm. series I used to read as a kid. And it's just such a lovely style. I really like it. It's just homey. I don't know how to explain it. Thank you. you know? <laughs> I like that as well. But uh, that was one of the pieces where I actually tried out black and white again and then came down to a finish, posted it, and just thought to myself, it isn't finished. It just doesn't feel finished without colors to me. I mean, it looks nice, but I'm not really proud of it. I'm not really, there hasn't been like a process and I'm not, I'm not bought in, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so unfortunately, that I won't probably do that too much for my personal stuff, but yeah. But it has been fun, definitely. Yeah, the colored ones, I really like them, but I don't know why, but the black and white ones, I don't know, they feel kind of different from me. I don't know. Maybe it's because of my bias, because of the storybooks I used to, you know, read when I was a kid. Maybe maybe that's it, but I don't know. They feel some... I, I'm a sucker for, like, you know, black and white just sketch pieces, you know? That's, you know, that whole meme about, like, the, an artist spending 19 hours, like, on, a, for example, a character and getting, like, 17 likes, but they post the rough 30 minutes rough sketch and it gets like 2000 likes you know yeah yeah, yeah. i know what it is by the way that is usually because the sketch is just more loose it's more expressive it's more of the soul of the artist said while if you're not that good with your art you will probably overcomplicate things if you're actually crying you know what i mean if you're like a pro you will get it if you're not that good yet you it's just not exp- as expressive so i can feel that with my line art as well if it gets too precise it just looks too clean in a way it doesn't really look expressive in a way yeah a little bit of roughness is nice once in Definitely, a while yeah yeah and by the way like I'm, this is just out of curiosity the character you're putting in most of your words this little red robe blue hat mm-hmm. wizard <laughs> um could you tell us a little bit about it and also one important question about it what what is his or her or its height <laughs> the height is important because as a 3d artist and i'm tr- that i might you know make one of your pieces i need to get that set that as a scale for me <laughs> good question so he is actually like pretty small he's not too small like a dwarf more like that size but just imagine like a dwarf with like i think 140 centimeters 150 centimeters not too tall 140, basically 144.2 that's exactly right. okay okay perfect and then comes the hat of course which is yeah. kind of like a quarter of his his body height but yeah, yeah, yeah. uh it just came to be actually i have to think when this actually started it wasn't too long ago i can't remember right now which one of my pieces actually started it but it just felt like i could use some character and then as usual with my art it starts really simple and without too much of a thought and then i take the things that work and leave away the things that don't work and the wizard just kind of worked for me um the only thing that i had in mind is that i want to have his robe in red and then his hat in blue so it just creates a nice color contrast first of all it's just red is not something that is usually in my pieces so it will immediately attract focus so that is 
my thinking there. And then just these this warm and cold color contrast with the red and blue will just focus more on him. Um, even if if he's not like huge in the in the drawing, you will still immediately see him. That was kind of my my thought. And then I just liked it, and I did a second piece with him. And then people just kind of start to to see him or recognize him. And then I actually felt that in my print sales, people just actually only sometimes bought like the prints that have him in it, kind of like a series, and they want to collect all of them. So that just naturally happened that he's basically everywhere right now. <laughs> That's awesome. And I've seen, you know, your earlier works first, it's its shape was different. It was like a little bit taller, skinnier, and it had like a normal like, cone blue head and a blue robe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and exactly. Then, yeah. And not just that, I noticed something. You first started with the pixel art, which was really interesting to me. True. So um, that is only the thing that you see in my socials. I pretty much just started with only painting. Um, then I went to line art because it just felt natural to me, like drawing and then adding just some color beneath it. But it looks like yeah, it's not compared to today. I will have some posts up in the next few days or weeks that will compare my like the beginning of the journey in digital versus like now. Um, and then I actually went to a painterly style again, and then to pixel art, and then again back to drawing line art, comic art. So there has been like several style changes all over the place. So yeah, that has been quite a journey. <laughs> All right. And um, so this next one is going to be a really interesting question. Um, how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a new piece? Basically, what does the structure of your pipeline usually look like? Phew. So I have a lot of ideas. Um, and ideas are like not really worth anything until you execute them. But you still have to have them in a way. So every time that I have an idea which is usually when I see something, hear something, listen to something, see a book or whatever. Um, I have like a list on my phone that I write down all of my ideas, which I don't know, it, it must have been like 300, 400 ideas right now. Like an insane amount. You can't, you can't really stop scrolling with it. And 99% of them are just like really bad. And most of them are really outdated. So I won't do that ever again, things like those. And then I just pick like the top ones if I start a new building and a new drawing or whatever, and just usually I close my eyes, I put some music on, like fantasy music, whatever. It just puts me into the mood, and I have to close my eyes. And then I just see what comes in a way. And then I just usually sketch out like some tiny thumbnails. I will do like five, six thumbnails beneath or next to each other and just sketch out and see what I like or which direction I like basically and then it just goes like clearer and clearer so the sketch will become a bit more narrow then I will enlarge it to like the full canvas then it just goes more clear to line art and then once the complete line art basically is done so I do the line first everything and then colors come beneath it basically so that is always the process that is pretty much the only thing that is really consistent with me that I always draw first and then I pretty much paint in the colors below that. So that has always been my pipeline. And then usually just like a touch of more light, more warmth somewhere where I want the viewer to look at, usually like somewhere towards the wizard or whatever or where his journey leads. And that is basically it. So pretty much always the same process. Um, but yeah, it's never been boring. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know what, your art style and your works really sometimes remind me of a bit of works of, uh, what's the guy's name? I think it's a Belgian comic artist. Are you I thinking think? of Mobius? No. Jean Giraud? You know, no, no. Do you know who was the creator of Tintin? Oh, Hershey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your artwork really reminds me of his in a sense. Definitely. He's always, um, he's also like the let's say godfather of that style, which is called yeah. Ligne Claire, like clear line in French, which is just, he's, I don't think he's the first one. I mean, people have done this in, in Middle Ages as well, but he's like the first one that probably just did it commercially and to a huge public wide area. So yeah, he's actually the godfather of that. I, I really like his art. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And which one of the Tintin books are, is your favorite, by the way? 
Cool. <laughs> I can't remember that because it has been ages since I yeah. last read of all of it. Usually somewhere um, that around, um, evolves around submarines. I don't know why. I just always Oh, found it, it was a two-part one. That one. There that could red be, yeah. Ratons. Pressure. Yeah, <laughs> that could. I, I mean, I don't remember the titles and the story and whatever. I just remember the summary, and it's just, it's, it's always stuck in my mind. And that has been like, I don't know, twenty years ago or something like that. So it has definitely impressed itself on my mind. Yeah, and um, have you ever used any parts of your dreams as inspirations for your works? Not too many, I must say. Um, I usually. If I dream, which I do like several times a week, it's just usually really weird <laughs> and not really like in that world that I want to live in. It's it's not like too bad or whatever horror or whatever, but it's just like really strange and not really cohesive in a way. Um, I'm just always waking up and think, what what was that? <laughs> it was just always weird. So I didn't really use parts of my dreams for my inspiration. No, no, it's just something that I do like consciously in a way all right and why like the main subject of your artworks are kind of like you know are in the fantasy settings of course mm-hmm. right yeah and what what exactly attracted you to this genre and you know this type of you know subject you know mm. That was probably to do with my childhood as well, because I was just always fascinated with this. And then I kind of lost all of that touch points with fantasy, with like engaging, immersing myself into strange worlds or whatever. And then it just came back when I was like 21, 22, I think. Um, It just seemed natural because I just... I had free time over the vacation time and uh, we were pretty much just stuck in snow. And I had pencil lying around, so I just started sketching again. And then it just kind of evolved from there, pretty much. Um, but why the fantasy landscapes? I don't really know. It's just, I just like to escape sometimes, like in my head. Like I just like to daydream of a better world, in a way. Um, as you've probably seen, all of this is based in my fantasy world. It's always pretty much the same world. It's called Argenta, um, which is funny enough, coming from Argentum, which is silver in Latin, um, because of the silver seas, because it's just a world full of lots and lots of islands. Um, pretty much a, a planet with only islands on it of several sizes or different sizes. And it's just a world that is better. I'd like to escape to that most of the times because there's just too much going on sometimes in, in our world. And I just sometimes wish or, or like to daydream of that world. So that is probably why I do it. But I, can't, I mean, I'm not a psychologist per se, so I can't really tell you why exactly I do that. And in this world, what are some of the biggest challenges and threats for people, for the ones who live in it? I'm sorry, you have to repeat that question. I didn't really sure. understand it. Uh, so in this world that you created, what are some of the biggest challenges and threats that are involved? Like, what are the enemies? The bad? Are there any bad guys? Are there any threats that people should be careful of? Like, mm. what makes life in that world challenging? You know. So, I like to think about it, but I never draw that. Um, as of goblins, I really like the concept. Um, like huge spiders, stuff like this, like half half-assed monsters basically not like huge like leviathans or whatever but just like spiders things that you know of basic fantasy settings in a way that is definitely a challenge for people there and then usually like droughts thunderstorms are like a huge thing in Argenta basically with all of the the islands being so close to the sea so thunderstorms are just like probably the biggest challenge for people there they have several gods that they pray to as well for this so yeah and like there's magic all around it so for example I, th- there's a lot of things that i pretty much know about my world but i will never draw them for example that it's always been important to me or the thought has been important to me that any building that gets built is like there's the foundation set and then there will be like a small gemstone that will be laid in down into the brickworks and then the building will build built on top of it kind of like a protection charm if you know what i mean but i've never 
I mean, I've had that idea for like two or three years, but I've never really drawn that. It's just my world is way bigger in my head than what I actually draw. So yeah, that's so. There's there's a lot of challenges, but I don't really show them too much. Or I guess and not really. In, in a way. Yeah, and in one of your earlier pieces, I saw there was an airplane in the air. So technologically, mm -hmm. I think. Do you know the game Arcanum from like twenty three four years ago? It's like a top down RPG. It's it rings a bell, but I've never played it. Basically, it's kind of like a top down isometric RPG, like Baldur's Gate. But mm -hmm. it, the setting of it is really interesting. Uh, it's like imagine Lord of the Rings medieval fantasy, but what if Industrial Revolution happened? So there's great, yeah. So there's still magic and elves and dwarves and stuff like that. But you know, there's a lot of technology. It's kind of like a steampunk with. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. medieval fantasy settings together, combined like zeppelins and airships, stuff like that. I have to write that down. Wait. Yeah, Arcanum. Yeah, Let's actually, see. A R C A N U M. Okay. Let's see. Arcanum. Because I I really like this setting. Well, actually, I love this setting of like this combination between, as you said, industrialized yeah. things and pretty much medieval and mage ma 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 magic as well. Um. But it's just, it's really hard to combine that and all of it makes sense. You know what Arcanum I mean? Arcanum did that perfectly. And there's this whole setting that there's a whole thing. There's all that's, you know, there's like dwarves who are super technological. They mm. deforest everything. They don't care about the nature and their, and their magic mana, like generation after generation has gotten really low. So they rely mostly on technology. But then there's elves who are still, I'd record different subclasses of elves who are completely against technology, you know, and they have a lot of magic powers still. So there's that. And your character in the game can, you know, choose how much they can balance like technology and magic. If you go full technology route, for example, for healing, you have to perform surgery and get surgery kit. But if, but you can't use healing magic anymore, right? Oh, nice. And then if you go full magic, you, you don't have the knowledge to use the technology. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's so many cool stuff, and the game is from like 20, I think it's 2001, 2000. It was made by one of the main developers of Fallout. That's how I know the game, Team Oh, K. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the game alone, one single playthrough, apparently, like, you know, is 70, 80 hours. It takes around that time. Nice. I will look that up, definitely. <laughs> yes. And I actually bought it on Steam. I played a little bit, but I was too bored and I had too much, so much to do. But yeah, I didn't continue. Like, I, really and I have the urge to check it out right now, but I won't do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. All right. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and like, you know, there's like, I really love the RPG genre. Like, let's listen, the games are from 25, 26 years ago in the early 90s. Like, the thing I was mentioning this in our podcast, like, recently, like, because of lack of technology, Game developers had to be super creative with what they had. True. And yeah. usually they made simple games, but super rich games. Yep. yep. Like look at Planescape Torment, look at the Fallout games, look at Arcanum, look at Baldur's Gate. They were all in the same periods. And mm -hmm. these top down RPGs were super hot back then. Yeah, definitely. And guess what? They still are. You know? Definitely, yeah. And they had to uh, find other ways to make it interesting. If you can't yeah. really make like huge effects and gameplay mechanics or whatever, you have to have like a great story. You have to have like an interesting character, whatever. It just it can't be bland in a way. It's funny that is something like that it has come up with pixel art as well. If you put constraints on one thing, usually the other thing has to blossom, has to be more creative, and that is something that they pretty much had to do. And today it just yeah, you don't have that much constraint, so it's easier to throw yourself out there and get kind of lost in a way. So yeah, I can definitely feel that. Yeah, they they were great. All right. And what are some of your favorite games around that time that you used to play a lot? Around that time, uh, let's see. I've played a lot of these settlers, if you know that. That's really familiar, but no. It's like I a strategy game with top down as well. So I played a lot of strategy games um, during that time. Onno, the eighth, I think. How is that called in, in English? Whatever. Like the the eight wonders of the world, I think that is called with like Vikings and Egyptians and whatever. So I, but no, I've never played that. Definitely, yeah, I've played a lot of strategy games, so that has been my go-to stick when I was a uh, when I was little. I, I usually wasn't that great with it <laughs> because some of them can get quite complex, especially if they're old games. Um, but they were so much fun. There's always kind of like that that 
fascination with different cultures and all the different cultures have different types of buildings and they all look different and they have different professions and whatever. There's always been that fascination of seeing a world, like a different world. It seems to me not so much different of books, for example. So that has probably been the case for me. Age of Mythology. Have you played that? Yeah, yeah, I've played that. Yeah, Age of Mythology was awesome. Yeah, actually, this year I saw that they're making a huge remake of the yeah. whole expansions. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. Have you we're, played? We're gonna that? play that in our group. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. yeah, awesome. And the thing is, you know, I have you played the one with the Chinese expansion? I didn't know that existed. Just a couple of years. I uh, know. Haven't played that. Yeah, it's an. I thought it was a mod or something, but apparently it's a, it was an official expansion. And oh. Cool. Um, yeah, it didn't get a lot of good reviews. And I saw some footage. The story the story was very bland. There was Amandra from the remember the Egyptian woman? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She makes a comeback from recurring characters, but not that much. But the OG, like you know, the the Atlantean expansion was great. Okay, nice. So have you remember do you remember the story mode of that? No, the story, no idea. <laughs> it was I'm not gonna okay, say anything. It's way too long ago. No idea about yeah. the story. I just remember the gameplay and stomping people with frost yeah, giants. The AIs were really br brutal. True, yeah. That's yeah. always the case with all strategy games. They're really brutal, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for example, with Command and Conquer Zero, I, really, I used to cheese that game. Like you know, you could just I would always pick the. I was a noob. I mean, come on. <laughs> I used to pick the like the laser general and just build huge defenses and bunch of airports and particle cannons and boom, that's it. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we've played yeah. it as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, and but I had a friend who used to always rush me with General Juzi's the explosive one. Oh he would, yeah, he would quickly make a bunch of those. Uh, suicide bombing like you know like motorcyclists and would just rush my base and i was like yeah it's <laughs> over yeah yeah games are just way too fun mm. and i still love that game like i don't think it's on steam is it i don't think so the last time i checked uh, i don't think it's on steam we played it on another platform yeah, there's I think a platform we downloaded... yeah i think we downloaded it on origin i'm not sure though yeah, yeah. But it's still one of my favorite strategy games is Tiberium Wars, the first one, not the fourth one. Never played that. No Listen, the story, everything is just insane. I love it. I love it nice. so much. Great. And, it's, and it still looks amazing, the game. Command and Conquer Tiberium Wars. I really love that game. And so, as being a favorite thing, let's jump into the next question, which is, who are some of your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? Um... <laughs> The thing that has inspired me the most, if I think back to where I came from, sounds a bit weird, I know, but if you're familiar with Asterix and Obelix, like Franco Belgian comics. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to, to play this video game. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I have all of those comics actually. Um, still have them, still read them actually. <laughs> they're just a joy to watch. They're, they're drawn so well. You don't really see that as a kid, you, you don't really get how nice they're drawn you just like the stories and you like the characters or whatever then when you return to it it's just story still upholds for adults as well and it's just insane how nice this was drawn especially if you consider how fast they had to pump that out so it's definitely a great thing and then today um but i only discovered him a few years ago and i'm usually getting compared to him as well was mubius so shoshi ho i'm not sure if you're familiar with him but he's like the for me, he's like the grandmaster of comic art. Like in any shape or form, you won't get better than this guy. It's absolutely insane what he did. He died in 2012, unfortunately, but he was like, that shit is insane. So it's just, yeah, that has been one of the biggest inspiration in terms of the style, just purely style. And then in terms of subject of what I draw, I wouldn't say that there's like artists that I admire the most or that has inspired me a lot. Um, just different ones are just really cool, but they haven't really inspired me. I think all of this comes usually from fantasy books, fantasy games, movies, whatever. Um, yeah, So, but there's, there's really amazing artists out there today as well. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. And all right, let's talk about something that, you know, we all already discussed about before we, you know, uh, kind of started the podcast, which is actually like a really serious and also interesting question. And I think a lot of people will really um, enjoy listening from, 
which is how to develop your R cell, which is a really huge question. I know that's a really yeah. huge general just question, I know, and subject. But since you're someone who already has developed their own R cell pretty well and have figured it out, so you must have a lot of experience in that regard. So for anyone who's you know starting out or want to know some tips or just just general advice on how to develop your R cell, you know, what do you have to say? Definitely. So it's a huge topic, so I'd be glad if you could help me with questions in that in this direction because it's just not. I mean, you can't read. Really, you could talk like two hours about this <laughs> if you're least. actually able about it. Yeah. Um, so, as I told you before, I, I've changed art styles a lot during my career. Um, or career, I, I call it career. It's just, yeah. But during the, like last five or six years, I've changed art style. I think around four to five times. Um, and I usually always had concerns about it. Usually something doesn't really work and you feel like you're kind of plateauing. And then I found that a lot of people, including myself, if you're plateauing, you feel like I need to grow somewhere. And then like a different art style that just looks cool seems suddenly really attractive to try out. And then you just jump on the next bandwagon pretty much instead of just focusing on the thing that you want to prove. Now, I'm not saying you have to stick to the style that you started with and you have to stick to that and everyone who doesn't do it is just giving up because I just did it myself. I just want you to or want people to realize that it's normal to jump bandwagons in that in, in style regards pretty much. And people usually have way too many concerns on what that means for them, if they will be successful with it, if they have to stick to one style or whatever. And what I learned about styles is that I definitely learned a lot with each and every one that kind of transitioned into the next one. So for example, before I did pixel art, I was in line art, comic art. Then I changed to, I kind of felt like I plateaued. Looking back, I definitely plateaued as well. So there hasn't been much progress for like half a year or whatever. And then pixel art is just you always have like several styles that are really cool, but you're never like really motivated to try them. And suddenly they seem attractive. So I jumped to pixel art and then went back to like, I had like 10,000 followers or whatever, 12,000. So it felt like a huge jump or like kind of, I would disappoint people if I jumped back to line out again, but it's just worth it. Just do it. Just follow whatever inkling you have in a way, because I, Hook up, or I learned so much about colors when I did pixel art because suddenly I couldn't fix anything with drawing. I couldn't fix things with line art. I just had to pick the right co uh, colors. I, it just had to be the correct brightness. I just learned so many things. So when I returned back to comic art, it completely transformed in a way. But you don't really have to always worry about your your style a lot of people are always worrying as well and if you look at it realistically we're nowhere in our career so like you have 400 fellow followers and you're really really concerned about well what will happen to my followers but it doesn't really happen if you just stick to the thing that you don't really want to do you will burn out anyways and you won't really like it so you'll probably stop at some point or you just hate it just because of your followers and you can't really let that dictate your how you how your relationship to your own art is so yeah art style usually is kind of like something organic and what i'd say is that you have to focus way more on what you draw and why you draw it so not like how you draw it in terms of style, but why do you draw what you draw? Are you drawing like characters because you think that is what people want to see? Or are you drawing characters because you actually like them and are immersed in it? Or are you shying away from landscapes because you've seen that lots of people like characters and they get like 20K likes or whatever on a, on a piece. And you kind of have to feel that you have to pivot into characters as well because you want that validation in a way. Or would you actually be an environment artist that likes that one more? So it's way more important, in my opinion, to think about why you do what you do than your art style in a way. So yeah, <laughs> that has been kind of my short TED talk about it. I don't know if you have questions about it. That are oh yeah, specific. definitely. Um, so from my point of view, which I'm a 3D artist and I'm not really good at 2D, so mm -hmm. something that's really m intrigued me is that like the fundamental practices are the same regardless of actually what you're going to make, all right? So 
it's like math. Two plus two is four. No matter what textbook you open up. But after you practice the fundamentals and get good at it, what process does it take to go from the fundamentals, which is kind of, you could say it's a basic default style, to yourself? But I also understand that, for example, me, I have a background in like learning languages and teaching English. So I know when it comes to, for example, accents, first you need to learn the grammar of the language, mm-hmm. learn how the language works and use it. Then your accent is something it develops over time naturally. All right, I can kind of compare these together but at the same time i still can't understand how that process happens in art into the mm. art like with with accents sure you may you, you watch american or british movies you're you get a little bit of that accent naturally but if you don't force anything you're you have your own set of accent you don't force it out yeah. it develops mm-hmm. over time and mm-hmm. i'm sure it's the same with you know developing your style but i'd say so as well yeah explain how that works for to the art and just art in general from the default a, fundamental style to an actual style over time, you know? It's a good question. I don't think there's like a default style, so to speak. Like you could say that the default style is to paint naturalistic. But to me, that's just one style. <laughs> so yeah, I think you can learn the fundamentals like lighting, composition, whatever. You can, or coloring, whatever, your contrast, values. You can learn that in almost any style. Of course, there are styles that are limited in how much you can learn. I mean, for example, I can't learn line art in the pixel art that I did. Although you could argue that there's still pixel art with line art. So you could always learn that as well. Um, So art styles to me are pretty much just vehicles. And you can't really learn every fundamental like in the same way with each vehicle. But that's also a reason to change or to try out or to just follow new natural progression or or development with your art style if you know what i mean and i'm not sure if i'm if i'm pronouncing this or if i'm explaining this correctly but i just think that art style is something that will help you find or get better at the fundamentals anyway unless you're like really abstractly drawing for example you can't learn line art if you're doing abstract paintings of course it's not like the same thing um i don't think it matters that much how what style we have the fundamentals are really important of course but you can take several angles to fundamentals if you know what i mean so i think that just happens naturally just as you said with the accents of course you you have to learn that because not every student for example will take the same angle to learning the normal language let's say like the default language, they will all take different angles. Of course, it's not like streamlined and everyone does the same thing. And I think it's the same thing with this, with art. Yeah, definitely. Not, not just with art, but learning anything, you know? Yeah, true. Uh, it's the same in like, just basically anything else, like even in martial arts. Like true. you're, you're like, like if someone like, for example, you're learning wrestling, the fundamentals are the same, but then mm-hmm. someone is, someone has an inclination. Oh yes, that's a key word. Inclination, natural True, inclination. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. it. Natural yep. inclination. Definitely. That's what's going to lead you to develop your style. Mm-hmm. Keyboard. You should, you should always follow that natural inclination. It's just you have to be conscious of am I escaping or am I running away from the work, from like my plateau? I'm not getting better, so I will just pivot to something else. Or am I actually following an inclination or a passion? Do you actually want to change or do I feel pressure to change? So that is like a huge difference. And it is also what you learn about yourself with being an artist. You learn a lot about yourself as well during that journey. Yeah, like that was what I was saying with wrestling is the same. Like, you know, after you've done the training, you're like, some people are like, you know, more inclined to go for take, single leg take downs, double take double leg take downs. Some people are more defensive. Some people are mm-hmm. counter wrestlers. Like it's just everyone's style is different, you know? Definitely. Mm-hmm. And like for example, but a bad coach is a coach that forces you to do a certain style regardless. I mean it's you need practice in all styles basically, but if a coach forces you to one single style and discourages you from doing your own style, that's a shit coach. True, yeah. Same with the teacher. Yeah. Like a great teacher will see what angle you're coming from and then help you with that angle. Yeah, basically, like, you know, it's good to work on your weaknesses, but it's better to work on your strengths more. 
Right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's always place for a niche in a way. You don't have to be a generalist and do everything. For example, like there's a lot of things that I really can't draw. They they look really bad, but I don't have to. So yeah, I just double down on what I want to do. I think yeah, that's awesome. in my in my opinion that's a that's a great approach to life unless you're shooting yourself in the foot with your weaknesses. So if they're if they're like really really prominent, you probably have to do something about it. If they are always hurting you, you definitely have to do something about it. But other than that, yeah. I would just yeah fix what you can fix and then just go for it. Also, it's completely normal to have weaknesses. It's a human thing. Of course, yeah. Like you're you're not going to be Mister or Miss Perfect. Yeah. Definitely. And if someone has scolded you when you were a kid or when you were even a little bit older that, you know, like a parent figure or a teacher figure that, you know, that made you feel less because you're bad at something, that just means, all right, your your brain doesn't really work with that stuff. And that's fine. True. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to be perfect at everything. Just find something you really love and be great at it. And that's more than enough, actually. That'll get you forward in life. Yeah, you can't. I mean, there there are people that are... There's nobody that is perfect in everything. There are people that are kind of average in everything or in in a lot of things. And I see that pretty much as a curse because you're just, there's no like inclination to do anything. There's no passion in a way to get way better with something. And there's no natural tendency or talent in some shape or form that you can double down and go on this journey to get better. And I mean, in in essence, that is what makes me and I think a lot of people happy is if they see progress, if they're coming along with something. And if you're like pretty much average in everything, it's probably hard to decide on what you should double down. <laughs> yeah, and what are you working on right now that you can tell us about? What kind of product, project is it? I mean, of course, if there's NDAs involved, we can skip right past this question. But if that's not the case, what are you doing right now? <laughs> so... Right now, I'm in the lucky position that I pretty much just do only personal work. Um, I've done a few commissions that I can tell you are pretty much just usually nostalgic things. I can't share those like visually because there's usually just people in front of their houses, families, whatever. So usually when people commission me, um, which is what I do, I pretty much do commissions, Patreon, brush sales, and then my prints. And uh, the prints are usually from people that are actually wanted me to draw their houses, their families, their yeah personal stuff in a way. Um, for example, if a close relative died, for example, I had uh, something in January where a grandmother of a guy died and he just remembers or has so many fond memories of her house and being there in his childhood and with apple orchards and everything. And he wanted me to draw that or paint that. So that is usually the project that I'm doing. Um, right now, I pretty much stopped taking on all commissions and want to focus solely on my personal brand in a way and on my print sales. So yeah, that is what I'm doing right now. Cooking up a new drawing right now. So yeah, it's <laughs> something that I usually share on my Patreon. All right, awesome. And I'll I'll put a link to your Patreon. I couldn't. I think it was in your link tree, if I'm not mistaken. But I'll yeah, put a link to the there, Patreon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll just let me quickly check there just to make sure he, the prince is there. No, the Patreon isn't on your link tree. Yeah, it is. It is called the, the art brush. journal. The art oh, journal is basically oh, this exactly. oh. because on Patreon I pretty much just talk about. I see it as an art journal because I can just yeah. write away my thoughts. And yeah. some people seem to enjoy it, and it seems like a like an art journal in a way, which I really like. Yeah, it's actually good. It's only two dollars per month, so if anyone is interested, and also there's seven days free trial. Um, yeah, you can go there and do that. And there's also the brush pack. Everything else we just talked about are in the link tree link down in the description. You can easily find it. Um, yeah, so the, if you go to the link tree link I posted, you can go to the art journal, and that's the Patreon that I just mentioned and we talked about. True. Thanks for the plug, man. Oh, I no. appreciate it. Of course, man. It's an episode. Of course, there should be a plug about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you were saying? I don't know. I, I don't know where we we stuck. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we talked about the projects you're working on, but oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You're working on personal projects now, which is awesome. But, you know, enough about art things that we talked about. Let, let me ask you something else. What other non art related stuff you got going on in your life? Maybe there's a hobby, there's a skill, or there's something you want to do. That is completely non art related, by the way. Is there anything else? Mm. <laughs> Not too many things, to be honest. Um, I'd say I love 
playing video games and reading, but that is just more of a hobby rather than something that I built. And everything else is just kind of is work to me and not really a passion or a project that I'm building. Um, so yeah, for example, I go to the gym a lot, but it's just it's work for me. It's not really a project that I'm doing. Um, so I pretty much just focus. I, I try to keep all of my time or most of my time to drawing, to art in a way. And then whatever I have left, I use with friends, with my girlfriend, with uh, video games, whatever. Um, but there's not too many other projects, so to speak. So I'm not really focused on, I don't know, collecting stamps for post stamps or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So pretty much just all art. All right. And now we reach the final section on the question of the podcast, which is called Time Capsule. All right. So let me explain. Um, it, imagine if you had only a few minutes to say, like, you had a window of opportunity. And in that window of opportunity, I want you to mm. tell me, till this point in life that you've lived, what are some of the most important and valuable lessons you've learned that you can share with us as a human to another human being that may be listening at any uh, point of time in the future? That's a deep question. Take your time. It is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Take um, your time. I'd say I share the probably the biggest challenge that I face myself right now as well. So it isn't like a lesson that I learned and I'm like now the grandmaster and I'm telling everyone else that I should do it. Um, but there's a, a kind of a set of people out there probably listening to this um, that is similar to myself as well with being like way too serious with things. Um, I usually take things too serious. I have way too many concerns about anything. Um, I usually tend to kind of throw out worst case scenarios that could happen i know they won't happen i'm doing everything that they won't do um, but it's still somewhere in my emotions in a way so if i could tell anyone and myself i have to tell this to myself all the time as well is to not worry too much especially in the world that is just yeah there's a lot of things going on there, there has always been a lot of things going on. And right now, media and everything is just making every problem our problem. Not to say that we should all be selfish and just capsule each other out. So we should help each other. We should definitely keep an eye out for each other. Um, but there's like a set of people that are similar to me that just worry way too much. Like it's okay to kind of see that thing neutral and don't worry too much about it so yeah it's, it's it's hard to i mean there's not really too many strategies that i can tell you this is what you should do <laughs> because i re didn't really find it myself other than just reminding myself all the time of it because if i don't remember my or remind myself of it it's just kind of is that spiral that is just worrying all the time so you have to pull yourself outside of this all the time. So I have little notes on my mirror, for example, or I sometimes remember that before I go to bed, whatever. So it's just like reminding yourself everywhere in your life that you shouldn't worry too much. However, you want to put up those systems. I don't know if it's like an electric clock or whatever, or something on your phone that just springs up every, I don't know, twice a day or whatever, however you feel like it. But it's definitely worth it to worry less because it's just it feels like you're you're missing a lot of things in your life growing up if you just always worry so yeah that has been or is a huge challenge for myself as well and art is something that helps me like stay clear of that in a way so if you can have a passion or a hobby or whatever that just helps you with this it's perfect all right, man. That's awesome. And actually, that's a huge problem for me as well. That's, you know, it's something, I guess, a work in progress in me, you know, because like I always, ex I'm exactly like you, but I, I don't know how intense your situation is, but I, my brain instantly goes to the worst case scenario, like the worst, most horrible scenario and tries to fix it. So I can feel I have a safety net against the worst case scenario. True. So, yeah. And when I have that, I can finally work on, you know, towards it, you know? That's Definitely. how my brain works. Like I need to be comfortable with the worst case scenario so I can fully go full focus mode on something. Yeah. Which is really weird, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of natural for some people. 
um, it's just always important to think rationally about this and just stand outside of yourself and look at your life and see it rational. Because I mean, <laughs> if I'm being honest, like the problems that I have are like nothing. I mean, it's so cheesy, but it's nothing. I mean, first of all, I live in Switzerland. It's like one of the safest, best places to live in the whole world. So compared to anyone else, my problems are like this big, but emotionally they don't feel like that. So it's just always important to stay rational, to to kind of leave your body, look at your life and see that nothing that you're worrying about is just kind of, it won't matter in five years, like not at all. So that is just always important. Yeah. And well, we've reached the end of this podcast and episode. Thank you so much for oh. coming by. Where can people contact you if they had any questions? But thank you so much as well. I really appreciate okay. it. This has been a blast. So I, as I said, I, I've turned down other commi- or other podcast um, admissions, but it's just been a blast. Um, contacting mm-hmm. me is pretty much easy everywhere on social. So I'm on Threads right now, Instagram, Twitter, or X, however you want to call it, and Reddit as well. So you can contact me and, and write me anywhere. Um, so yeah, everything will be in the link tree pretty much. I like to keep it concise and to one link in a way. All right. Awesome. You heard it, folks. And I hope you enjoyed this episode as well. And leave a comment down below if you have any comments, suggestions, or critiques, you know, as always. Or you can send me a DM on the Career Podcast Instagram page. I'll always check them out. And with that being said, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Till the next episode. Bye-bye.